beautiful morning this morning. Not really as chilly as it has been other mornings. And it looks like our problems are fixed for now. Very good news indeed. After Rob took everything apart yesterday, eventually had to open up the actual broadcast modulator. And you know how they build the electronic devices so that the layman can't really get in there. I suppose they're not exactly layman, but it had to be the piece of equipment that was the deepest in the vehicle and the fuse had to be anyway, we did it, we got it and we're hoping to bring you a beautiful morning. We had lion calling all night, so what I've done this morning is I've been to the gate and back just to see if the lion have crossed because they would have one had come into the southeastern corner. but I don't know whether he was inside or outside the fence. There's an area where the fence goes over the river and it's been washed away and it hasn't really... I mean, an elephant can get through there. Well, not quite an elephant. It'd have to be a small elephant. But it's certainly easy enough for a lion to stroll through. And, uh, well, that's where a lot of the activity was. Those beautiful pug marks of on the photo that Rob took. I also took some, but I have the presence of mind to take a, a lovely shot that Rob did of the lion prints and the up looking upstream along the Tumabati River. Had lots of pug marks in the mud and of course we had a, a whole morning following two lion. I can tell you a little bit more about that one for riding. It's like a bit of a strange morning. It's not as chilly as it has been. And I guess because of some smog and dust in the air, the sun isn't quite as bright as it has been rising. The intensity of red that it was tells you that there's a lot of interference in the atmosphere. Okay, let's go and find some animals. What we do have, I'm going to go backwards and we can show you this beautiful light hitting this little herd of wildebeest that we have. And then we'll be able to look at the moon above them. Are you ready, Leon? Yeah? Aaron is in F FC, FC being final control. Some of you, it's your Saturday night, some of you waking up early on a Sunday morning. There's the light just hitting the side of that big marula tree right now. The moon above it, and the wildebeest. And just to the right of that big marula tree, behind the wildebeest in the foreground, is our little character Billy. Billy the wildebeest. No, Billy the baby wildebeest. Built out of parts of all sorts of different animals. He's still doing fine. Now I believe there were a bunch of other youngsters sadly taken by resident leopard. I mean Billy at the moment, that little youngster is smaller than him, even an impala.
very peaceful scene. I think what makes it feel different this morning, there isn't the usual dawn chorus. It looks like the whole herd's going to be wandering in front of us. It should be good because they're coming through the spot of sunlight. Come everybody, we want to give the head count. in much of a hurry. Hearing Impala to my right, still the, the, the last days of Impala ratting and there's an Impala male doing his thing. Obviously we must have a herd of Impala there because it's warning off other, other rams. Quite possible that the wildebeest hearing the Impala are starting to make their way there, being more comfortable around a lot of Impala, perhaps using the Impala as buffers between them and predators. But a lot more ears, eyes, ears, noses to sense danger. Come, Mrs. Billy, bring that little boy of yours. I suppose if it's a girl, it'll be Billy Jean. Across this side. It's greener. Stunning moon. Moon's a balloon. There's Billy. Under the moon. That was David Newman's biography. I read when I was a teenager. Wonderfully inspired by him. Not sure what I was to do with that inspiration. As long as there's no hint of danger around, nobody's alarming. Even there we go. Um, for wildebeest to get a little bit frisky, and then Billy's run off. Hey, little boy, little girl, can't do that.
Okay. I think it's time to see if we can find some sign of these lines since we haven't had line on camera. I'm calling Jesse. And our line to be in the area, not if them to say, oh yeah, I'll find them. Well, he hit one. Say good bad news. So we've done a, a sort of a north, from camp actually, not north, we've done a, a pretty much straight ride from camp to south to the lake to the south. And we're riding amongst the grasses, where we're going to get them is. heard them calling this morning, alarming. I think this is why the wildebeest are coming this way, because they're Zenar joining these in Kala. And with daylight coming, they'll all hang out together. There's a nice little gap forward or back. One little strand of grass in your way. Mm -hmm. There's a little tough. It's okay, it might work for the 3D. Yeah. Yeah, got it. Uh, the best gap we've got. A couple of the zebra. And here are a lot of ox peckers flying out now, too. Also, probably just waking up, finding animals to test it for the day. That's the stallion we've got facing the right. I think. So there are no cat tracks between us and the gate, so we're going to head off to the river and see between camp and the river, and then we'll head east towards the fence line. Because these lion, we're actually going to have to touch on the fence line this morning, because these male lion were up and down that fence yesterday. And I'll be able to, hopefully, be able to tell something. I heard over the radio a little bit earlier that one of the males was in Royal Malawani's workshop, which means that it's probably that big black maned lion they call the black dam male. I think he's also known as Marvin. Sounds like some of the guys are reluctant to to name things. It's Marvin from the north. The black dam male. Um,
Right, let's see what we can find on the way down to the river and around, around the river. You're welcome to send in questions or comments or anything about wildlife. You're welcome to send that to drive questions at wildearth.tv for me to answer or react to. If you wish. Have the road, this whole road. Are you all going to come across the road, Charlie? Oh, behind it. Some in front, some behind. Do you want? No. no. I've just happened to stop in a spot that kind of split them up, but they all, some of them had already started crossing the road to the right. So I figured we stopped that all. On across, but they decided to run behind us most of them. Any other issues besides wildlife and thorny bush issues? Um, dive well, sorry, drive questions and drive feedback is the other one. Any other feedback you want to give? Drive feedback at wildearth.tv, our Facebook pages, for the wildlife and, the, and my side of things. We'll be posting and uh, commenting and interacting with everyone on Thorny Bush Private Nature Reserve uh, page and on the technical side of things the Facebook page to post is wildearth.tv Thanks Aaron Another beautiful day in
by my sapien. Well, we are right outside camp. Um, you guys are probably heading between the two camps, our camp and the, the river lodge down the bottom here. Or also one of the owner's houses down here. How are you? 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 Hi, Tim. Come back with. Hi, Where's Adam? Where's Adam? He's driving. Ah, yeah. See you later, guys. Right, what do we got? This is the main intersection up road where if anything's moving east, west, north, south, besides the boom and the parlor. And oh, that must be leopard. The boom, the boom, lots of the boom. No lion, though. Monkeys and baboons and impala. Okay, well, we're going to cross the river. It doesn't look like any of these cats have been walking here last night. We'll check across the river and we'll go and look around that little water pan. That little pan called Albida pan. And onto the fence line. It's important. I know it's not fun to see the fence. I'm really not that keen on it, but that's where the lion have been very, very active.
go. Go for the temperature down here, Elio. Yeah. It requires a little bit of, yeah. 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 Edible stalk very busy fishing already. Only the females will walk this here. Is it too much of an angle? The most optimistic feeder you'll ever see, stabbing your beak into the water, hoping that you're going to find something. So you might see her actually shuffling her feet to chase maybe the old frog in the mud, in the sediment. But it must be productive enough to keep the saddle bull here. And as the days wear on and this water starts drying up, it's already probably a, about a third of what it was two weeks ago when we were setting out, or a week and a half ago. And it's dropping fast. And the, the faster the water level drops, the more concentrated whatever's left in the water becomes. And so it becomes a lot easier. And I'd imagine that once it gets reduced to a really small puddle, the, and, you know, an increase in bird species that are coming, going to come in and feed. 
at the moment the stalk seems to dominate. There have been hamacops, there has been a woolly neck stalk here, and there have been fish eagles there too. And yesterday, yes, yesterday I saw a pied kingfisher. Huh? There's more in the river than here. Hearing any alarm calls? The baboons haven't even said anything since waking up. A little discouraging, which means that there's not likely to be cats around. Well, not that the baboons can see yet. Let's continue. Later, stalk. Happy frogging. The closest we've been able to get through there actually. Morning to Donna in Canada. Here's the question of the morning. Pretty late in Canada, Saturday night. Donna was asking. Since we're going into the winter months now, the dry season, well, I suppose more from the point of view of temperatures dropping, what, what is the change in animal behaviour? What, what changes are there? Well, obviously, for some of the smaller things, there, there, there's a, a serious decline in insect activity on account of well, both temperature and humidity and uh, moisture availability. Uh, the dry conditions that prevail, a lot of the insects won't be able to move around at all, or they die off when the cold comes. A lot of insects are merely adults for a season, for the duration of the summer, and by the end of the summer they've laid their eggs for the next season. Um, I think there was a perfect question to ask, there's a challenge for you now. The purple crested Turaco that's coming to the really low scrub here, very unusual habitat. If we can only get it, might be maybe jackalberry there. Uh, there is a oh, she's gone. Right into that baby jackalberry at the back. No, but it was so quick as soon as you turn the camera, it moved. It's so unusual to have one out of the big tree canopy. We're not going to get to see it through the back there. So, Donna, back to you. The reptiles, well, amphibians too, reptiles and amphibians slow down, their metabolism slows down completely, they're almost going to a tuber they don't quite hibernate the way things do in the northern hemisphere in areas where you do get severe cold and, and snow and ice. Um, but they do go into a, a state of slow down metabolism and inactivity, but they will be active in the warmer times of the day. I mean, once the sun comes up, you find sometimes snakes popping their heads out of their holes to sun themselves. Lizards and geckos become active. Uh, there are some of the, well, the diurnal geckos are the small dwarf geckos. As opposed to all the larger geckos that tend to be nocturnal because during the day there's so many lizard species and competition is so, so, so severe that it's, these geckos have taken to be nocturnal to capitalize on the amount of nocturnal insects. 
and maybe it's not as active at night these days because it's cooler. The other thing is that there are still a few insects, so it is. So they will always get to that antenna. Uh, but with some insects about there are the lizards that barely even excavate, they barely even go into a slow slower metabolism. They uh, still active every day. I'm an insect uh, the lizards at home that I, that I watch every day. And there are a lot of grasshoppers that will still be around during the dry season. So as we're going up the scale then from the Pretty sexy to the lizards. Spiders, of course, there's still some spiders that'll be out, some spiders that are not. Most of the web spinning spiders tend to become dormant right now because there are not that many flying insects. Right, we're coming up to the fence line. I want to have a look at the iron track. It's not a simple answer to Donna's question, it's quite extensive. And you'll notice I didn't use the D word. Oh, with a short on the fence. You can hear it. to the male going up go back down to the river of the sea quite swooping out there somewhere electric current in this fence. So this is the edge of Thorny Bush. This is the eastern boundary of Thorny Bush that we're on. These lines were marked. There was one I think outside the fence. The neighbor property. But they know this fence because they patrol as part of their territory. So they know that down here in the river it's possible to get in and out. I'm not going to turn this one across. I just want to see if there are tracks over and above our tracks from yesterday. Let's see whether this male, one of the males has been up and down there. See, while there's still some electrical strands crossing, most of the fence has been washed away as it goes through the riverbed. And from well, that, just... Now come, look at all the baboons. They're only just waking up. Oh, lions have been back here since we were here yesterday. There's just so much movement, it's hard to focus on any one in particular. They would have been frantic if the lion was still in the area. They've got incredible eyesight to boons. And they pick up audio cues from everything else and they pick up the sound of bird alarm calls being primates highly intelligent so they, they capitalize on the distress of other creatures well, I suppose everybody does out here in the wild because an alarm call whether it's a bird or an animal is exactly that it's an alarm call and it is picked up very quickly very easily to be able to be recognized as exactly that an alarm and that danger is near Managed to get any baboons? I'm getting. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, very, they're, they're very, uh, active. They're, they're not 
We get back to Donna's question about the changes going into winter shortly once we get going again. But uh, Shirley was asking, do these baboons have large troops? Well, yeah, they do actually. This is a fairly large troop. I haven't been able to establish how big because they're very, very shy. They obviously have this typical human baboon conflict going wherever there are people, and there are baboons, there's going to be conflict because baboons would like. Baboons try to take advantage of of human ignorance and uh, get into human things. They know that we keep food, they know that our food is tasty. They become very, very uh, determined to raid our food stocks. So people have probably been chasing them for years, chasing them away from camps. They've calmed down now that we're sitting here and we're not chasing them or anything. There are a lot of youngsters that are coming to the edges of branches to look at us. But to get an idea of the size of the troop is virtually impossible unless we can find them all moving back to their trees at night and they're moving as a, as, as a troop to get a better idea of the, the size of the troop. So carrying on with Donna's question, we were talking about insect spiders and reptiles. There they are actually coming out into the sun now. The more we sit, the more they come getting in close to So the birds. Birds, what changes with the birds is that all the migrants leave. Great relief for all the resident birds because there are a lot of migrants that come in that are competition with our, in the, our local species. Some of the migrants are are actually breeding migrants, so they're actually from here, they just leave here in winter. Some of them breed in Europe, so some of them are European visitors that intrude on, our, on their African counterparts' territory in the summer and displace them to some extent. But summer is a time of abundance, so there's often enough to go around. Um, it obviously does become harder for birds to find food, uh, particularly the insect eaters. And so what we find, there are a number of insect eaters, and we will see it too, as it dries up and it gets harder for them to catch insects. Things like the fork-tailed drongos and the flycatchers and uh, bee eaters. And some of the insect eaters that use larger mammals to, to find insects, the, the fact that larger mammals move through the grasses to, and as they chase insects it becomes easier for these birds to, f to catch things. That's quite a branch these ends to go on down at the bottom. Come all the way from the top and bends down. Thanks Rob. Opportunism of some of these birds and creatures that use other creatures to help themselves find food. Um, and then of course the mammals, the changes we're finding or we're going to see in the mammals is that at the moment they're all spread out, there's still a lot of water and as the cold and dry season wears on, vegetation starts drying up and uh, so does some of the water, the smaller water sources. So the animals start becoming more concentrated around the more permanent water sources. 
as well as finding the greener belts that sustain greenery longer than the higher higher ground where it dries up. <laughs> and the changes we're going to see going into the dry season in the vegetation are going to be quite stark. The leaves are starting to fall on some of the trees. And we're going to see this change from green fading to yellow and brown. And when all the, a lot of the trees lose their leaves, it's going to look like a dead landscape. Time of abundance right now. Despite the temperatures dropping, it's still wonderfully green. The bird that we're hearing is known as an Aramark babbler. One babbler. Wait until you get a dozen of them doing that. They call your mates babbler. And when you get two colonies or two family groups of babblers competing, it can be quite noisy. It's amazing to scratch the back of your head with your foot. A bit of grooming, just sunning a couple of youngsters that are twiddling their thumb. There are a lot of oxpeckers too. You got this little cluster leaf because that branch coming down with those three front three. It's the sound of the big male. He's been mating. That's post coital noise. You got those four up there. Yeah. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, do no evil. <laughs> four little children. Jamie Lim. That's a new name. How does human activity impact animal behavior in the reserve? 
Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on which animal. Some of them, they ignore it. Some of them, they move, they keep their distance from the, the vehicles. Some of them, it doesn't really impact on their lives very much. As in the case of the baboons, they've become quite relaxed. As you can see, a lot of the youngsters are sitting in the branches watching us. They're inquisitive. But if I started up the vehicle now and moved, they'd all start running away. They'd all start climbing down out of the trees and disappearing into the bush. Into the bush. They're not fond of us. Uh, the elephants are obviously quite nonplussed. But mostly, I think we're talking about this reserve only because one has to remember that depending on the type of human behavior, that, that dictates what the animals do. So it's, 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 it's a very broad question in that it, it, it's very, very much dependent on how passive human activity is. And then even then, it depends on whether that activity, that human activity is consistent enough for the animals to be able to gauge what we can and cannot do. Unfortunately, there are some places where the general public are allowed to go, like the Kruger National Park. And while 95% of the people that drive around Kruger behave themselves and they are there because they, they want to see animals and they behave themselves, this is human nature. There is always going to be the individual that has to buck the system, that has to be a contender for the Darwin Awards. <laughs> and it's just it's those individuals that have actually caused the most trouble because while most people are, are behaving themselves around the animals those idiots that try and do silly things are the ones that are going to throw the animal off, off guard or, or, or put a spanner in the works by being so inconspired by showing inconsistent behavior and then animals just don't know whether they're coming or going and they're likely to become nervous but uh, in places that like East Africa for example the areas up in East Africa where tourism is so dense so well just no rules and you go into the Ngorongoro crater and parts of the Serengeti where animals are just crowded by vehicles it, huge impact on their behavior. I mean, cheetah, for example, they get surrounded by vehicles are prevented from hunting. The, the, the vehicles disturb them. They're diurnal hunters. They're not really nocturnal hunters. They will hunt at night when there's a full moon and they can see and they've got open ground. I've, I've watched cheetah hunting on a full moon. But I've also seen how they get so hounded by vehicles that they get hunted even know the cheetah to lose her cubs because she hasn't been able to feed them because the vehicles hound them so much. So in that sense it depends very, very much on the human activity. And in a private reserve like here in Thornybush, excuse me, where there are very strict rules about how the vehicles behave, how the guides behave, the guides have to be qualified, they have to have a certain level of qualification to be able to drive around or even walk in a big five area and therefore there is a consistency in behavior and the animals here at Thorny Bush always oh, a Malachite kingfisher just flown down the street, upstream. But yes, with that kind of behavior the animals tend to kind of know where we're coming from and they, they know that we're not going to chase them, they know that we're not going to tease them, they know we're not going to threat and so the animals have calmed down to a large extent here. And, uh, at least there's no uh, there's, there's no um, negative impact. You know, one could say that something like this live drive is probably about the least impact of tourism in the wild as possible because yeah, we can reach thousands of people who can visit to some extent. I mean, obviously you can't get the feeling of it, of sitting in an open vehicle the way you do really sitting on an open vehicle, but we can bring you the sights and the sounds and uh, some of the pleasures of it without having to be here, so far more people can experience this. Um, 
But it is just one of those things on this planet, all around the world, where <coughs> an attraction creates tourism, and it's the very tourism that can impact so heavily on it that will destroy the attraction. And so it's important to keep it, keep it a bit of a balance. Yeah, you have a <coughs> what we would call high cost, low impact tourism. <coughs> Very expensive game lodges, and not everyone can afford, and not that many vehicles, not that much of an human impact within the reserve. <coughs> It becomes sustainable. It becomes um, what's the word? I mean, or self. Uh, uh, can't quite articulate it. But basically, the more this kind of tourism, this kind of a, uh, safari activity, there is in this particular reserve. <coughs> I don't mean more, as in. Okay, I'll get in there in one moment. I don't mean increasing the number of vehicles, but the more there is this kind of activity, the more the animals will calm down, and so it will benefit tourism. You know, tourism will benefit the animals. And okay. You go ahead, Aaron. Shelley in Canada. Question on baboons. Do they only eat fruit and leaves or do they also eat insects? They eat, they eat everything up to even impala. And most of the time, especially during the summer months, there are, they'll, they'll, they eat grass. They feed on quite a lot on grass. They'll sit on a grassy area and they'll pick blade for blade and they'll, <coughs> excuse me, they'll eat grass. Leaves, bark, fruits, seeds, berries, um, roots to some extent. They lift rocks to catch arthropods, anything from insects to scorpions. They're not too fond of snakes. They're quite scared of snakes actually. They will raid birds' nests to get the eggs or the chicks. They will also, I've known them to, to raid weaver birds' nests and uh, eat only the stomach contents of the young or the adults that they catch. Not even the birds, and because there's too much feathers, I suppose. But instead of them spending hours and hours and hours to get a handful of seed, if they take a weaver bird or a chick that has been fed a lot of food uh, or an adult that's got a full crop of seed or even a stomach full of seed, they can get hours and hours worth of seed in one, in one go. So they can raid a colony of weavers and decimate the colony to some extent. But towards the end of the dry season, we're only going into the beginning of the dry season and I don't know if we'll, we would see it here. So it's, um, not something one sees very often, but towards the end of the dry season when their protein levels are low, and uh, we, uh, we're going into spring when the, la the, 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 the young are being born, particularly the lamb, the impala lambs, water piglets, <coughs> you will find that the baboon can take to hunting and having a predilection for red meat. It's quite an incredible thing to watch because most of the year, in fact, all year round, you will find baboon and impala in association with each other. A baboon will feed around impala and an impala will, would like to stick around where baboon are because with baboon in the trees around them, there are always sentries with their keen eyesight as well. Baboon are your best early warning signal when you prey animal like an impala that's got everybody after you, every predator under the sun. So they do have this close association, yet every now and then in the lambing period, November, early December, 
you find the you know, big male baboon will grab an impala lamb, just rip it to shreds and eat it. And the troop might fight over pieces. I've seen them do that with baby wart dog as well. Very, very gruesome. <coughs> <coughs> Shall we continue? <coughs> we can just go forward a little bit and I'll see if we can hone in on some of these lion tracks in the mud here. Work better on that side. big lion folks. So if you can see them better looking into the sun a bit. Well if this lion I think he's to this side, I think he's come back this side of the river or whatever. But there'd be no side of the Yeah, they were up and down here yesterday. This is rewinding time. The only that I've got is that the lion have gone back up to the north. Brenda, morning Brenda. How do snakes get up trees? Interesting. What was that? Uh, Brenda. A lot of the trees have got lowered branches and things, but they, they are incredibly good climbers, particularly of course the, the, the tree snakes. I'll show you, if you get close to some trees on my right hand side, and I can show you the texture of the bark, I mean, it would be lovely to show you how they get up. Um, by example, actually finding you a snake, oh, it's a citrus bush.
They use the tiniest fissures and cracks and bumps. Now, a lot of trees have got a, a very decent bark and a, a bark that makes it very easy for snakes to climb. But I've seen, a, I've seen things like spotted bush snake and worm slump climbing even almost smooth trunk trees by oh, just, just wrapping their body halfway around the trunk and holding on tight. Let's see if I can find a tree close to me that I can show you the texture of the bark and kind of little ridges that they might take to. It's kind of difficult to explain, but even the tiniest little knot in them, in a, they will use that there's like a step going up. elephant from two days ago heading up here. Thinner trees, like this one, even though it's got nice texture, the trunk of this tree like this, this is one of the bush willows, rusty bush willows, uh, a thin tree like this, the snake will actually be able to wrap itself around the trunk and, uh, and, and climb up. I've even seen them 
wrap themselves around the trunk of a very smooth, thin tree and actually concertina themselves up. But there are nice little smaller branches, but you can see also that as the bark is peeling, the little knobs and cracks that a snake is able to cling to, it's what is really incredible is a very big tree that a snake hasn't got a chance of wrapping itself around the trunk and how they'll climb up a vertical trunk that is almost seems like there's nothing to cling to. It's wonders of nature. I don't know, the people are afraid of snakes for no reason. They're really incredible creatures. To be able to do what they can do without limbs. The fact that they can be so mobile and so active and so... about them. It's incredible. Lion activity yesterday, nobody seems to have found anything yet. They did have one female, one lioness earlier this morning, I heard. But there's been no sign of these males other than the tracks we've had, and of course, word that one of the males had moved, moved into, went into the camp of Royal Malawani last night, out into their workshop. A spanner or something. Or a screwdriver, half oh, half. Oh. A left handed screwdriver. Okay, I think the signal's still looking good. have to do really slowly. This is Is that one of those starlings? There they go.
Yeah, okay. What do you mean by here? One of the bales I think is being picked up in the north. This bale is still on the road, still heading this way. But now we're getting difficult because we're now moving off of Naleti Road soon and it's going to become, or maybe not, this is before I be empty anything. He's either still walking on the road and he's still heading in a northwesterly direction. And he's not having that road, he's gone there. It doesn't look like it. It looks like he's still on the road, he's still heading this way. He's too far ahead of us. Maybe crack a door and if we had been here, we might have kept him. He's still walking on the road. Why well, I picked it a little bit? I'm counting on my knowledge, but... Okay, anyway, things have come close. Suddenly being replaced by leopard tracks, but no lion, elephants. So a car's been here. Somebody's been driving here.
can only check further on the beat vehicles here. It could be that he's left the road. He might have gone cut through to the north. Onto the road to my right. I'm not seeing anything here anymore. Not that it's such a thing track. Go up a little bit further, there are also some fresh elephant and leopard tracks here. Get up to this next junction. Can't get a better right idea. Okay, that is getting quite bad here, and we'll please repeat that. Now, please repeat that. Phyllis, morning Phyllis. Not too sure what you mean. Phyllis is question, are elephant footprints unique to like human footprints? Thinking that what Phyllis means is each individual elephant. Uh, thinking that's possibly what it means. Just one minute, Phyllis. I just want to check this big junction out because the junction is a good thing. Is that with this big cut line that I have here? Elephant has gone that way. This big cut line. Can Give me an indication of whether any of these cats went south. Would have cut through at an angle. Fortunately, we can't go down up to the north because we've got no signal there. And after yesterday, I'm not going anywhere where there's no signal. Tracks of the big five within 100 meters of each other. Phyllis, every animal. Oh, okay, I'm gonna take a copy.
Sang, can you give him a thumbs up? They want to know if he's still on the back. Yeah. Haven't seen you in ages. What is it that you have on that lock on South Eastern?
نے بش in mind you following and, and their tendencies to either move around marking the